But this time we're going to start our presentation today, which is pediatric COVID-19 vaccines. COVID-19 vaccinations for children ages six months and older. And today we have uh, Dr. Oshalisha Kashek, who is the medical director of pediatric infectious diseases and the director of antimicrobial stewardship program at UniPoint Health in Sioux City, Iowa. And she's the clinical assistant professor of pediatrics at the University of Iowa at Harvard College of Medicine. Dr. Kashek is an American Academy of Pediatrics national spokesperson, a member of the Iowa American Academy of Pediatrics Board of Directors, and recipients of the 2019 Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Childhood Immunization Champion Award for Iowa. She's very active in AAP Iowa chapter as the Infectious Diseases Champion, the Immunization Champion, Legislative Committee Member, and Immunization Community Member. She also serves as the CDC Project First Line and American Academy of Pediatrics Infection, Infection Prevention and Control Ambassador and on the Infectious Diseases Advisory Board for National Pediatric Pandemic Network. She has been appointed as Iowa State Physician Champion for the Iowa Department of Public Health and Iowa Medical Society Joint COVID-19 Vaccine Confidence Initiative. Dr. Koshik has published her scholarly work in several peer-reviewed journals, presented her research at premier national and international conferences, and serves as an editorial board member or peer review for several medical journals. So basically what I'm telling you is Dr. Koshik is a very busy woman, uh, but we're very grateful to have her come and give her presentation today. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Dr. Koshik. Thank you so much, Laurie. I'm honored to present today's talk on COVID-19 vaccination for children ages six months and older. So um, right away going to the objectives. So the objectives of today's talk are to discuss importance of COVID-19 vaccination in children, to discuss the CDC ASAP recommendations for COVID vaccination for children ages six months and older. So I'll cover from six months to 17 years. Uh, also to describe the vaccination schedule for these patients, uh, both in immunocompetent and immunocompromised patients, as well as the discussing uh, of guidance around administration and co-administration with other vaccines. Next slide, please. So when we talk about COVID-19 current situation, as we can see from the map, um, Till last month, when I was making the slides, I just started making all the areas were mostly green. And now, like as of last week, they are all mostly orange and yellow. So that shows how much the community level transmission has increased, uh, given the Omicron wave we are facing right now, especially the BA5 variant, which accounts for more than 80% of all cases. Um, just to stress that we are still not out of the woods. And, you know, it's again rising in several parts of the country. Um, we have had a total of more than 89 million cases and unfortunately more than 1 million deaths, which is very sad. Next slide, please. As far as pediatric cases go, we have had over 13 million pediatric COVID-19 cases till date. And we have also, you know, that accounts for around 18.6% of all cases. Next slide, please. This figure shows um, the cumulative COVID-19 cases as well as the percentage increase in child cases. So as we can see, um, over nine states, you know, have had 400,000 plus cumulative child cases. So that number has increased remarkably. Um, six months ago, those were like 120,000 plus cases and now we are at 400,000 being reported, you know, from many states. Next slide, please. Also, this figure shows us the child COVID cases added uh, over week, uh, you know, every week they keep a data. So this is AAP and CDC joint data. And as we can see, you know, the peaks represent the various spikes and the, you know, the peaks of the various variants we have had the first spike as well as, you know, the Delta and then the Omicron, which is uh, by far the highest. And again, we can see, you know, some uh, increase in the cases recently as of last last month, uh, continuing into this month, and Midwest, uh, shown on the, west, uh, on the left, is not very far behind. Next slide, please. 
And what about infections in Iowa? Well, this map represents the county-wise positivity uh, of the testing rates per 100,000 population. And as we can see, many of the areas are already turning um, dark uh, blue. Um, we are recording an increased number of cases here in Northwestern Iowa as well. And the ICUs are getting filled up with you know, adult patients uh, getting sick with the Omicron variant. Um, as far as the pediatric percentage goes, uh, over 15% of all um, tests have been positive solely in pediatrics in Iowa, and we have had over 143,000 pediatric cases cumulative in Iowa. Next slide, please. So all these statistics, they point towards the importance of vaccination. All they um, help us is, you know, to understand the importance of COVID-19, as well as to understand the importance of vaccination and what uh, is the need of vaccination in this hour. We do need vaccination to prevent any further damage uh, that COVID-19 pandemic has done to our population. So if you look at the age-wise breakdown, since the beginning of COVID-19 pandemic, among ages six months to four years, there have been over 2 million cases over 20,000 hospitalizations, and tragically, over 200 deaths. These numbers are even higher for children ages 5 to 17 years of age, as seen here. So COVID-19, and we have all seen that, can cause severe disease and death among children and adolescents, including those without any underlying medical conditions. And so future surges will continue to impact children, with unvaccinated children remaining at higher risk for severe outcomes, including multi-system inflammatory syndrome, including post-COVID syndrome. So definitely vaccination is our best bet to protect these children. Next slide, please. This figure shows the breakup of um, US population by age. And so that shows like, you know, over the right, the pediatric populations are represented. And that uh, is a huge area for us to um, accomplish vaccination in these age groups. Next slide, please. So uh, the CDC um, stresses that as with all other age groups, priority is vaccination of unvaccinated individuals. And nearly 18 million children uh, between the ages of six months and four years are now eligible. And over 25 million unvaccinated children and adolescents between the ages of five and 17 also remain eligible for vaccination. The benefits of vaccination certainly outweigh risks in all ages and receipt of primary series continues to be the safest and the most efficient way to prevent serious COVID-19. Next slide, please. So based on all these, as well as uh, the trial uh, results, uh, the ASEP uh, recently met in June and they uh, recommended uh, Moderna as well as Pfizer um, vaccine series for children below five years of age. So a two dose Moderna vaccine series, 25 microgram is a dose, is recommended for children ages six months to five years, and they have to be given 28 days apart. Also, they recommended a three dose Pfizer vaccine series for ages six months to four years, the dose is three microgram each for the vaccine series, and they have to be given 21 days apart for the first two doses and at least eight weeks uh, for the last dose. Next slide, please. Also, during the meeting, they voted unanimously to approve Moderna vaccine in a two dose uh, vaccine series for six to 11 years. The dose is 50 microgram and a two dose Moderna COVID-19 vaccine series for ages 12 to 17 years and a dose of 100 microgram. No boosters have been approved for Moderna at this point. Next slide, please. So um, when the data was presented uh, in the ASIP meeting for uh, the younger age groups, like below five years uh, for mRNA COVID vaccines, uh, they concluded uh, that both were conducted during Omicron predominance, but different months and incidence levels. Hence, efficacy estimates for these two vaccines cannot be directly compared. However, both the vaccines met the non-inferiority criteria for neutralizing antibody levels, and hence both received approval. They also concluded that post-authorization effectiveness studies can help determine subsequent timing and need for boosters in this population. Next slide, please. So what are the side effects? The side effects noted in the trial were very, very minimal and they were transient and mild or moderate. Uh, there were no cases of multi-system inflammatory syndrome or myocarditis or pericarditis or Bell's palsy or any deaths uh, seen in this, these clinical trials for both the vaccines. Next slide, please. So based on that, we have now two options for the younger children. So this table nicely um, covers all the vaccine products currently approved or authorized. Um, the Novavax vaccine was just approved two days ago for ages 18 years and up, and they haven't updated the table to include that uh, on the CDC uh, webpage, but that's only for 18 years and up. So um, not relevant for today's talk. 
Also, Janssen is approved only for 18 years and up, not for younger children. So for our purposes, the two vaccines that are approved for pediatric age group are Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine. So the upper part of the table shows us the Pfizer preparations. As you can see, for different age groups, they have a different uh, vaccine vial cap color preparation. So for like for six months to four years, you have a maroon preparation. For five to 11, there's an orange. For 12 and up, you have two, purple and gray. And uh, the doses also are mentioned here. So for the younger children, a three microgram dose. For the five to 11 year old age group, 10 micrograms. And for 12 and up, 30 micrograms. The uh, booster dosing is also mentioned here. For five to 11, it's 10 mics. And for 12 and up, it's 30 mics for Pfizer. Now for Moderna, as you can see, again, they are different colored preparations for different age groups. Like we have for six months to five years, a dark blue with a magenta uh, label border color preparation. And then other colors are also mentioned here. Uh, for 6 to 11, you have a blue and purple combination. And for 12 and up, you have a red and blue combination. Now, um, the primary series, uh, the dosages will be 25 mics for the youngest. For 6 to 11 years, it's 50 microgram. And for the 12 and up uh, year age group, the primary uh, dose must be 100 micrograms. Now, as you notice, uh, Moderna is only approved for booster dosing in 18 years and older. And the dose there is 50 micrograms, which has been approved. Next slide, please. So this table again uh, shows us more detail. And uh, as you can see, um, no diluent is needed for any preparation for Moderna vaccines. For majority of Pfizer vaccines, you need a uh, diluent for pediatric preparations, except for the gray uh, wild cap colored, which is approved for 12 years and up. Next slide, please. So we'll discuss the pediatric schedule now for people who are not uh, immunocompromised. So it applies to most of the children who are immunocompetent. So Moderna has been approved right from age six months to 17 years, as I was mentioning, in a two-dose series. Uh, the uh, interval is four to eight weeks apart. Um, the Pfizer preparation uh, for six months to four years has been approved for a three dose series. The uh, between dose and dose two, there's a gap of three to eight weeks. And between dose two and dose three, uh, you have to give at least an interval of eight weeks. Uh, for five to 17 years old, um, the, there are three uh, doses again here, but the first two are the primary doses as we are very well aware of, separated by three to eight weeks. And the first booster, which is the third dose is given at least at five months. So remember five months is the time for the first booster in immunocompetent people, while the interval decreases to three months for immunocompromised hosts that we will discuss next. So next slide, please. So for people who are immunocompromised, this is a schedule and I'll walk through it slowly. Um, for Moderna, uh, right from six months to 17 years, three doses are required. So always remember in pediatrics, in immunocompromised patients, you need an additional primary dose. And so that's what is the third dose. So for Moderna, three doses are needed. Now for Pfizer, since you're already giving them three doses, six months to four years remains the same as three doses. And you will have to have eight weeks between dose two and dose three. For five to 11 years, the patients that receive Pfizer, they will have three doses, which includes you know, the third dose as the additional primary, but you'll also give them a fourth dose, which is the booster dose. And that has to be given at three months rather than five months in immunocompetent dose. So you give them a total of four doses. For 12 and up, as you know, if they are immunocompromised, they need a second booster also. So after the three primary doses, you give them the first booster after three months, and then you give them a second booster after four months. Next slide, please. So this table nicely summarizes all of that. So let me walk you through that. So for Moderna, for most people, remember they need two doses, okay, if they are immunocompetent. So just looking at the center of the table, for most people, immunocompetent people, Moderna preparations, they only need to get two doses at this point for CDC recommendations. Uh, for Pfizer, they will receive a total of three doses because from five years to 17 years, you need to give them a booster, which is the third dose. But um, for the younger children, six months to four years, the regimen is three doses. When we go to the immunocompromised patients, they need a total of three doses if they are receiving Moderna. And then for Pfizer, if they are six months to four years, they'll get a total of three doses. If they are five to 11 years, they'll get a total of four doses, which includes one booster. And if they are 12 to 17 years, they will receive a total of five doses, which includes two boosters. Next slide, please. 
So when are you considered up to date? And these are recent um, updates made in the CDC website. So CDC uh, clearly states that one is considered up to date with COVID-19 vaccines when one has received all doses in the primary series and all boosters that are recommended when eligible. Vaccine recommendations are different depending on your age, the vaccine you first received and the time since last dose, like we discussed. Um, the CDC has also developed a CDC COVID-19 booster tool, which is a patient facing tool, and uh, it helps uh, to determine the need and the timing of boosters for most patients, and they just need to plug in their age or, you know, uh, their specific information to get, uh, you know, the answer, uh, and it's available at this link um, on the CDC webpage. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the extended interval between dose one and dose two. As you know that I mentioned three to eight weeks or four to eight weeks between dose one and dose two. So the three to four weeks is actually considered the short dose, shorter interval, uh, while the eight weeks is considered to be the longer interval. So let's see what are the various benefits uh, for both the doses. So for a shorter interval, like a three week uh, interval is preferred between the primary doses in immunocompromised patients. In anybody who is at a higher risk for severe disease, like people over 65 years of age, any people with household members having higher risk for severe disease, or in general with high COVID-19 community levels. In that case, you will always prefer a three week or a four week interval for Moderna and a three week interval for Pfizer. Um, for a longer interval, that is eight weeks, um, anybody between six months and 64 years who is not immunocompromised and specifically adolescents and young adult males to reduce the risk of myocarditis. So the age group between 12 and 39 years where you have the high risk of myocarditis, those people have to be given the primary series at an interval of eight weeks. Okay, so those are the few um, exceptions there. Next slide, please. So now let's talk about the various products. So for the Pfizer, as you can see, the products are listed here. So for um, six months to four years, we have a maroon uh, wild cap colored product. The dose is three micrograms. And then the product that's approved for five to 11 years is orange wild cap colored. And uh, the dose is 10 micrograms. And the gray uh, preparation is available for 12 years and up. And the dose is 30 micrograms. Next slide, please. For Moderna, again, the products are shown here. So the dark blue wild cap color with the magenta label color is approved for six months to five years. And the dose is 25 mics. No dilution is required for any preparations. For six to 11 years, um, there's a dark blue preparation uh, with the wild color being dark blue and a purple uh, label color. The dose is 50 microgram. And for 12 years and up, a red wild cap color uh, preparation is approved with a dose of 100 mics. Now, please note here that um, there can be, you know, uh, since the booster dosing for Moderna is dosed at 50 micrograms, so the blue color, the central preparation, the blue colored with the purple label can be used as a booster for 18 years and older. And the red wild cap preparation can be used as a booster for 12 years and older, for uh, 18 years and older, uh, only if it is halved in the dosing. Okay, so the red colored preparation can be used in its normal dosing for a primary series dosing for 12 years and up. But if it is halved in amount, then it is used as a booster dosing for ages 18 and up. Next slide, please. So children should receive the age appropriate vaccine product and follow the schedule based on their age on the day of vaccination, regardless of their size or weight. So if a child moves from a younger age group to an older age group, say he moves from 11 to 12 during the primary series or between the primary series and between the booster, they should receive the vaccine dosage for the older age group for all subsequent doses. Now, that's a general recommendation, but CDC does allow some exceptions, especially if, you know, they're uh, given like... Um, you know, the higher age group dose is given at the lower end, etc. And I'll go over those scenarios in the next few slides. So next slide, please. So there are certain scenarios and I'll walk you through those. So suppose children who turn from age four to five, uh, for the Pfizer, the recommendation would be to give maroon cap just before the, you know, the patient turns five for the first dose, if they uh, receive the dose one as the maroon cap, then the second dose will have to be orange. And of course, the third dose will have to be orange because the child will all already have turned five. So that's the recommendation, right? Next slide, please. Also, if they turn uh, from like four to five, 
between their second and third dose, then of course they will um, have the orange cap as their third dose. Next slide, please. Now those were the recommendations. However, as you can see, either of the two can be given at, in both those situations and that's not considered an administration error and the doses need not be repeated. So erroneously, if you give maroon or orange just around the fifth birthday, that's okay as long as you are completing the three dose series. Next slide, please. Same goes for Moderna. So the example they used is if the child turned from five to six, then of course you should go from a dark blue magenta to a dark blue purple combination. Next slide, please. But again, if you give either the dark blue magenta or the dark blue purple erroneously around that time for either doses, that's acceptable. It's not considered to be an administration error. Next slide, please. Again, they give a similar example from 11 to 12. So you should ideally move from a blue cap while uh, preparation to a red cap while preparation. That's the ideal recommendation. Next slide, please. However, if you do erroneously give red before and blue after or blue before and red after, that's acceptable. Next slide, please. So in general, we should try to remember what is the um, you know, recommended wild color and what's the recommended preparation for all age groups. But if there are a certain uh, you know, um, exchanges, uh, then they are allowed just around the cusp of the um, you know, switching uh, recommendation ages. Okay? Um, however, if you do add like more diluent than required, or if you did not give enough vaccine dose that's recommended, like all those situations need the dose to be repeated. Okay? So what about the um, length and the size? So this is the needle size that should be used for administration in this age group. And also, as you can see, for younger children, we can use the thigh. But for older children, we can use the deltoid muscles for administration. Next slide, please. Also, uh, COVID-19 vaccines are not generally interchangeable. And the same mRNA vaccine product should be used for all doses of the primary series. However, in exceptional circumstances, like if you don't have the product, if the patient comes in and they don't remember uh, like which one they received or there's no record of that, those are the exceptional circumstances in which they can allow some mix and match. And I'll walk through those scenarios next. So next slide, please. So yeah, so that's what it is. So mixed series can be allowed only in exceptional circumstances. So for ages six months to four years, for children who receive different mRNA products for the first two doses of mRNA COVID vaccine series should receive a third dose of either mRNA vaccine eight weeks after the second dose to complete the three dose primary series. Next slide, please. So in scenario one, if you did receive Pfizer as your first one, and then the second one was Moderna, then for the third one, you could give them either Pfizer or Moderna. And again, remember, these are exceptional situations. Next slide, please. Again, the second acceptable situation, which is, you know, just an exception, very rare, not like routinely to be followed, is also um, an allowable exception is um, as you know, noted here, if you give the first dose as Moderna, second dose Pfizer, then after eight weeks, the third dose could be either Pfizer or Moderna, but we should make sure that the patient receives three doses. Next slide, please. So as we saw, you know, there are more opportunities for errors when we have more products. Uh, and you know, if the products are not labeled or if you know, there's a lot of um, patient volume, et cetera, that can lead to like errors. Next slide, please. However, CDC does provide for prevention of those and uh, there's clinical guidance for error prevention uh, as noted on this uh, slide. So these are the web pages and the web links that can help us. Next slide, please. So now we should talk about the adverse effects. So, uh, the patients should be counseled, you know, that family should be counseled that children in general uh, may experience fewer side effects than adolescents and young adults. And we have seen that in practice. Uh, only local side effects like pain and swelling and redness at the injection site, like those are the most common side effects. Um, rarely they can have fever, headache, loss of appetite, but really no, um, no severe side effects are seen. Next slide, please. Also, since this age group, like under five years of age, um, Children, you know, children of this age usually are prone to febrile seizures. Febrile seizures are not uncommon and they can occur in infants and young children with any condition that causes a fever. That's why CDC um, will closely monitor for febrile seizures following vaccination. But do know that um, febrile seizures were extremely rare in COVID-19 vaccine trials. So that's not really something to be expected. But just because this age group is anyways prone to develop febrile seizures, we should keep an eye out for that. Next slide, please. 
And also, um, I listed the contraindications and precautions just because there have been uh, many updates on that. So, um, as you know, history of a severe allergic reaction or anaphylaxis is the true contraindication for any vaccine receipt in future. So that's like the basic contraindication and maybe the only contraindication. But uh, for Janssen's, we have several levels like history of um, thrombocytopenia thrombosis syndrome or a history of GBS following receipt of Janssen's syndrome, a pre-existing immune mediated thrombocytopenia syndrome, etc. So Janssen has largely fallen out of favor and mRNA COVID-19 vaccines are usually preferred in general. Next slide, please. And precautions uh, would be any immediate allergic reaction to any other vaccine or therapy or people with non-severe immediate uh, reaction, like with an onset less than four hours uh, when they receive the vaccine. They must, you know, the benefit certainly outweighs the risk, but we might defer the vaccination and then wait and then give after a while. Um, Again, the new um, contraindications um, that have been added are for COVID-19 mRNA vaccines, as well as for Novavax history of myocarditis or pericarditis, for um, Janssen's vaccines, a history of pre-existing GBS, or else um, even a history of MIS-C, that is multisystem inflammatory syndrome or MISA, they are considered precautions. And I'll discuss those in greater detail. Next slide, please. So what about the current or prior SARS-CoV-2 infection? So COVID-19 vaccination is recommended for everybody ages six months and older, regardless of the history of symptomatic or asymptomatic infection. Patients with known current infection should defer vaccination till at least they recover from acute illness, as well as they have met criteria to discontinue the isolation. Um, viral testing or serologic testing prior to vaccination is not recommended. Next slide, please. And then again, CDC states that um, people who recently had SARS-CoV-2 infection may consider delaying a primary series or their boosters by three months from symptom onset or a positive test, um, since you know the increased time interval may result in improved immune response. However, if there is a high risk for COVID-19 severe disease, if there is a high community level of SARS-CoV-2 circulation, then those should be taken into account as uh, you know, the primary factors um, that drive vaccination. Um, and also always remember to counsel your patients that uh, even if they have had infection, vaccination following an infection further increases protection and a number of studies are showing those. Next slide, please. And what about myocarditis? So myocarditis has been um, really uh, been a serious topic of discussion because uh, we did see some uh, myocarditis and especially in males, 12 to 39 years of age. Uh, but the incidence is very, very, very low compared to when, when you consider the myocarditis risk associated with viral infections in general or even with COVID disease per se. So the risk of myocarditis or pericarditis after receipt of an mRNA COVID vaccine is much lower than the risk of myocarditis associated with SARS-CoV-2 infection. Next slide, please. So when we talk about myocarditis, we must remember that Infectious etiology, especially viral agents, are the topmost causes for that. Next slide, please. And COVID-19 is, you know, a viral disease. So multiple studies have shown that um, multisystem inflammatory syndrome has been associated with cardiac involvement and myocarditis, as seen here. Next slide, please. And also in one of the systematic reviews that I authored, uh, we studied more than 600 children and out of those, one third had cardiac involvement and lower ventricular left ventricular dysfunction. Next slide, please. So per se, uh, what I mean to say is COVID-19 disease can cause myocarditis in a much larger proportion with bad outcomes compared to what the vaccine does. Most of the patients that did uh, develop myocarditis after uh, receiving the vaccine have uh, been hospitalized only for very short periods and almost all have recovered with complete resolution of symptoms by 90 days. So the latest data that was presented at ASIP uh, presented um, showed us that there have been a total of 630 cases with uh, myocarditis um, in the pediatric age group but all of them have, uh, almost all of them have recovered. Um, they did undergo um, cardiologic, uh, cardiologic uh, follow-up and most of them have resolved. Also, the data suggested that uh, in adolescents and young adults, the risk is highest after the second mRNA COVID dose, and it is mostly seen in the week right after vaccination, and the comparative risk with booster doses is very, very low. 
Also in age groups where the product comparisons can be made like the 18 to 39 year olds, this, uh, some data suggested that the risk of myocarditis may be higher following vaccination with Moderna vaccine rather than Pfizer vaccine. And so when I was looking at the numbers, there was like eight excess cases per million doses with Moderna compared to Pfizer. Uh, that was statistically significant. But again, the findings are not consistent across all US monitoring systems and multiple monitoring systems. So um, what about five to 11 year olds? Rarely there have been some cases reported and um, but most of them again have recovered. However, no cases of myocarditis or pericarditis have been reported in children uh, in these trials for Moderna or for Pfizer vaccines for the under five year old age group. Next slide, please. So all in all, um, the benefits certainly outweigh the risks uh, for children for COVID-19 vaccination. And of course, there's um, are, you know, there's a requirement or a recommendation for increased interval in uh, males aged 12 to 39 years. Now, nevertheless, they should be made aware of the possibility of myocarditis following the receipt of mRNA COVID vaccines, particularly in the week after vaccination. And certainly they should seek care if they develop any symptoms uh, like chest pain or shortness of breath, et cetera. And any cases should also be reported to VAERS. Next slide, please. What about people who receive passive antibody products? So before there was a recommendation of waiting three months and then it was changed. So now COVID-19 vaccination does not need to be delayed following the receipt of monoclonal antibodies or convalescent plasma. However, only an uh, exception is those who previously received a COVID vaccine. The administration of EVU shield, which is um, pre-exposure prophylaxis, should be deferred for at least two weeks after COVID vaccination. Next slide, please. What about history of multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children? Well, the criteria have to be met, and there are only two criteria that need to be met now. Clinical recovery, including normal cardiac function, as well as it should be at least 90 days after the diagnosis of missing. Then these children and adolescents can be offered vaccination. Next slide, please. What about the rare instance, very, very rare, in which children who develop MISI after COVID-19 vaccination? Now, looking at the data, there's, the incidence is extremely low. Um, millions of doses have been administered and only six cases have been reported. So it's like the incidence is 0.3 cases per million doses. So it's hardly anything, but still CDC uh, provides us uh, with the recommendation that if the MISI was 90 or more days after uh, COVID-19 dose, um, clinical recovery, including cardiac function normalization should have been achieved, as well as there should be at least a three-month you know, period, and then you can give them. But if they're still undergoing, um, you know, evaluation, if it was just uh, within 90 days after COVID-19 dose, then first of all, you must establish whether it was really after the vaccine or after infection, because most of these cases are actually after infection. So, you know, just to diagnose um, an exposure or an infection in these patients, and while they are being evaluated, the COVID-19 vaccine doses should be deferred until more data is available. Next slide, please. What about co-administration? So COVID-19 vaccines may be administered without regard of timing to other vaccines, and they can be administered simultaneously with all other vaccines on the same day. Next slide, please. They, could, they should label each syringe, and they should administer the vaccines at different sites. And if they are more reactogenic vaccines, then they should be administered at different on different limbs. Next slide, please. So like this is a list of all the reactogenic, um, you know, adjuvanted vaccines that can be administered in a separate limb from COVID. And in practical uh, situations in our clinic, for instance, uh, people are administering them in different limbs. Um, so like, you know, the infant vaccines, they are giving um, COVID-19 vaccine with the PCV on the other limb while doing the DTAP containing vaccines in the other limb. Next slide, please. The only exception is orthopyrus, orthopox virus vaccination, the new vaccines, ACAM 2000 and Janios, and people might consider waiting four weeks after orthopox virus vaccination before receiving an mRNA COVID vaccine because of a theoretical high risk of myocarditis, uh, especially for adolescent and young adult males. Um, however, if it's uh, in the setting of an outbreak, then administration of orthopox virus vaccine should not be delayed because of receipt of mRNA COVID vaccine. Next slide, please. What about vaccine timing? Uh, what's the grace period? So any doses that are administered up to four days before the minimal interval, known as the four-day grace period, are considered valid. Uh, 
So if a dose is administered prior to that four day grace period, then what do you do? So if it is a primary series, you should repeat the dose. If it's the first booster, then again, you should repeat the dose, but you do not need to repeat it if it's the second booster. And doses administered at any time after the recommended interval are considered to be valid. Next slide, please. Preterm infants, um, regardless of their birth weight, should receive COVID-19 vaccination at their chronological age according to the schedule. And also, regardless of maternal status of vaccination or COVID-19 infection before or during pregnancy, infants should be vaccinated according to the recommended schedule. Next slide, please. So this um, figure shows us the COVID-19 vaccination uh, data currently in the United States. So um, as of July, around more than 78% of US population has received one dose, 68% has been fully vaccinated, and 48% have received one additional dose. Next slide, please. And this chart nicely shows us the coverage in terms of uh, primary series completion, booster dose eligibility, as well as booster dose completion by age. And as noted from this figure, um, in the pediatric age group, there is much room for improvement. However, um, this also shows us the age break, age wise breakdown. And um, like in some of the age groups, we do need to, you know, uh, focus our attention and pediatrics is one of them. Next slide, please. So from the AAP and CDC data, ages five to 11 years, um, as of um, July 6th, 36% uh, have received their first dose of the vaccine and 29% have been fully vaccinated from 5 to 11 years um, age group. But ages between 12 and 17 um, years, 69% have received their first dose. However, 59% have completed their two-dose vaccination series. Next slide, please. And this is again AAP and CDC data, which shows uh, the proportion of US children between five and 11 years who received their initial dose. And uh, that's uh, shown state wise. So Iowa, 29% um, have received, uh, under, you know, between five and 11, 29% have received the first dose. Next slide, please. And between 12 and 17, those who have received their first dose, that's shown state wise and uh, we are more than 50% in our state. Next slide, please. So this is um, COVID vaccination data for Iowa in terms of counties, and you can see the fully vaccinated uh, percentage in different counties in the map shown here, and more than 60% people in the state have been fully vaccinated. Next slide, please. So what's the CDC approach for reaching all children aged six months to four years? Well, the goal is to ensure that all eligible children have access and the ability to get vaccinated. And all of the entities listed here can play an important role in achieving that goal. However, the primary care providers play a major role given the age of these children. Um, and so those will be the center of, you know, most of the activity. Next slide, please. So we have seen in various researches, it has been shown that doctor's offices are common locations for vaccination and are the most common places where routine vaccinations are con completed in general, because not only uh, do they provide an opportunity for vaccination, but also uh, to provide comprehensive pediatric care, including screenings and including anticipated guidance. So all in all, uh, doctor's offices play a very, very important role in promoting vaccination. Next slide, please. So pediatricians, providers, including family practice providers, and including um, nurse practitioners and other providers in the state, they all have the responsibility as well as the resources to uh, promote vaccination. And AAP has suggested certain strategies like you know, promoting the culture of vaccination, just talking about childhood immunizations as the norm stressing that vaccines are safe. There's, you know, in terms of children, in terms of school safety, in terms of community safety, in terms of uh, returning back to normal lifestyle, like that should be the central message here. Also, the cost savings attributed to childhood immunizations are immense and that should be, um, that should be stressed. Again, pediatricians are here to help and, you know, they there would be engagement of more trusted voices. We are trusted by our patients. So that should be the driving force behind that conversation. And also when they need it, you offer education, you, you be there as, you know, willing to answer their questions and also offer more communication resources or direct them to more CDC resources. So in my, um, you know, 
further slides, I'll also show like what needs to be communicated. Like there are several resources for patients out there. So they need to be, um, you know, um, directed to those. Also to make efforts to improve access and availability of vaccines. You know, that has to be um, our goal. And our state's track record generally of, you know, delivering great immunization rates. And Iowa has been, you know, um, very upfront in delivering immunization so far. I mean, our averages have better than national averages. So in most of, for most of the routine immunization, so we must maintain that. So that should also be one of the messages. Next slide, please. So again, the American Academy of Pediatrics is, has a lot of resources to help our pediatricians as well as providers in messaging. And also, um, it is very hopeful for the future. Like there's a lot of optimism as seen from this press release um, when these vaccines were approved for six months and older children. So um, really, you know, it's just to, optimism and enthusiasm should be exuded by all of us. We are almost there. We have vaccines to cover almost everyone down to six months of age, and that's a big achievement. Next slide, please. So to summarize, uh, COVID vaccines currently approved or authorized um, by FDA are effective and they are safe uh, and they prevent serious outcomes of COVID-19, including severe disease, hospitalization and death. COVID-19 primary series is recommended for everyone ages six months and older for prevention of COVID-19. And a booster dose is also recommended for ages five years and older if eligible. And COVID-19 vaccines may be administered without regard of timing to other vaccines. So remember that during our office practice, like you can give them with all other vaccines at the same time. And that includes simultaneous administration on the same day. And as I mentioned, pediatricians, providers, and other healthcare entities, they play a very important role in vaccination of the patients. Um, next slide, please. So as I was mentioning, there are certain clinical resources. And if you go to all these uh, websites, they're very helpful. And I also included um, um, like CDC COVID uh, clinical considerations, which is a very important page. And it also includes the frequently asked questions. Next slide, please. And then again, the interim clinical considerations is the main page for, you know, where all the updates are made and it's shown here. And it has been recently updated. I updated these slides as of last night. So they keep changing all the time. So now with the inclusion of Novavax, the 18 year old and up pages are being, you know, refreshed for that. Next slide, please. Then these are for vaccine recipient education and quite important resources right there. Next slide, please. And some for, you know, communications with parents and caregivers. Um, next slide, please. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for your kind attention and would, you know, turn it over to Laurie. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you so much. I think um, I saw one in the chat, but I could not uh, read it. So if you can. Which vaccines would you recommend administering at the same site versus avoiding COVID administrations? Right. So only, you know, so usually every, you know, the nursing uh, people are quite smart about it. Like, you know, the highly reactogenic vaccines in general are to be given in a separate limb from COVID. So remember that. So every, all the vaccines have to be separated by one inch or more. That's the basic rule. And if you have more reactogenic vaccines, you give them in another limb. So for instance, for the infant vaccines, as I was mentioning, so they, they will be giving like PDRX in a separate limb because that has uh, the HEP-B and, you know, DTAP and IPV combination, while they'll give the PCV and COVID on the other limb. So that's what the combination they were using in, in our clinic. Again, you know, they, they usually try to give the DTAP containing vaccines in the other limb. And uh, we did have, I did mention that on my one of my slides on the presentation on the highly adjuvanted vaccine. So maybe um, it, that's mentioned there as well. So just remember, like, you know, DTAP containing vaccine, give them in a separate limb. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, any other questions? Um, question is, yes, um, there will be a copy of slides. We will send those out to those that have joined us today, and we will also have those available on our websites, um, both the IMS and also the Iowa chapter of AAP. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think, you know, one of the things that, you know, we need to keep in mind, too, is now we're coming up on the back to school 
um, time and can pertain to um, get their, their physicals and all those kinds of things. And it's a really good time to be able to talk to, to our, our patients about, about COVID vaccines um, as well as all their other wellness needs. Questions or comments? I think pediatricians have always played a great role in routine vaccinations. It's it's time, like, and most of the COVID vaccinations in general, you know, I know there was a proportion of children that were getting vaccines in the pharmacies and other places too um, for the older age groups, but especially for the younger age groups, I think the onus falls more, most of, most on us, because I don't think for younger than three years, um, many children are getting any vaccines in the pharmacies, like, and they're not, um, I mean, most of the younger children do not go there and not supposed to get the vaccines there anyways. They go to the doctor's offices. So I think the importance of doctor's offices needs to be stressed even more. Well, there are no more questions. Once again, once again, thank you, Dr. Kashik, for this um, very, very important conversation about um, the pediatric COVID vaccines. And, uh, you know, as these have just kind of come out and now we're encouraging kids to get vaccinated, this is really important information to, to come about. Yep, and then we need to protect them from what we can because there's certain other things, so many scary things out there, especially, you know, we are getting more and more for like monkey box warnings. And, you know, you just need to protect from whatever you can because that's not generally available right now for everybody. So, you know, COVID-19 vaccine is available to protect yourself and your loved ones, you know, from whatever you can. So that actually points towards the importance of vaccines, all the routine vaccines as well, you know. Just because we don't see them doesn't mean that those diseases don't exist. And same is true for COVID. Um, Monkeypox is bad, but smallpox was worse, and we could eradicate that with the power of vaccines. So, you know, just remembering that, you know, these diseases can resurface. Um, so just just keep them down with vaccines. One last call for questions, just in case anybody has something. Okay, well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us, and um, we appreciate um, your time. So, thank you again, Dr. Kasha. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone.